Praise the Lord, it's Bible study. Let's, uh, let's open up with prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in Bible study and to study your word. Help us to have open hearts and minds, ears to receive what your word has and what the spirit has for us. And we'll give you all the praise and glory. In Christ's name, amen. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Bible study. We are in, we are in Acts, chapter, Acts chapter 7. And we left off last week. And we had gone through how Stephen, remember Stephen, he was delivering a message to the people there, and he had shown them how that from Abraham all the way through, the prophets or the men of God would try to reason, try to teach, try to help the, the congregation or help them, help the Jews, the children of Israel understand what God was trying to convey to them and what God was trying to, uh, how God was trying to deal with their hearts and for them to uh, turn away from the things that they wanted to do and turn towards God. And they consistently did not want that. They consistently persisted to be what he says here in chapter 7, and we'll pick up in verse 51. So Acts chapter 7, verse 51, he said, Ye stiff-necked, and uncircumcised in the heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. So do you. Just like your fathers did. And he had gone. Remember, Bible study last week. He had gone through all of this, this uh, uh, time frame from Abraham all the way through Jacob and, and the children of Jacob and all the way through the children of Israel into Egypt and Moses uh, leading them out of Egypt and all this stuff, how they were stiff-necked, meaning they were obstinate. That's what that word means. They were obstinate. They were unwilling to uh, bend or unwilling to, to uh, mold into what God wanted them to be. The children of Israel consistently were coming up short, attempting to keep the law. Understand something here. He was sharing with them, helping them understand that the law was not something that they, can, they needed to continue to follow after. Because if the law is written in your heart, you'll do it according to God. But there was new ordinances. There was a new standard that God was bringing in. Stephen was trying to show them none of them were willing to break the vicious cycle. So many times we... Grow up, and people have said, my grandfather was this, my father was this, my uncles were this. Maybe it was maybe drunks, or maybe it was living in this sin, and it just befalls me to be the same thing. Well, their forefathers had done the same thing, and they were not willing to break the cycle. They were not willing to break this vicious cycle. They were also not willing to be open-minded to the teachings of the Scriptures. The law continuously pointed them to the ultimate sacrifice. They just would not see it that this sacrifice that Stephen was pointing them to was the same sacrifice that the law was pointing them to. So for Stephen to come at them so strongly, they were furious. They were driven to the point of closing off their willingness to listen. They were uh, uh, not willing to hear him out, and even not even to not even willing to understand him. In Acts chapter seven, verse fifty-four through sixty, it says, "When when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God." Uh, the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So this is, Stephen had just told them that they were stiff-necked in verse 51. He said in, they were stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears and you do always resist the Holy Ghost even as your fathers did, so do you. Which of, your prof which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? They've persecuted every prophet that have come before now. And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one. 
of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. And he goes into this, and they closed off themselves. They would not listen to him. They begin to speak evil towards him. They would they shut off their ears. They would not even be, they would not even, they were not willing to even try to understand what he was trying to share with him, them. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he shared with them that he saw the Son of Man standing next to God. This very one that they would not accept. This Messiah that they continuously refused and put their hands up to, pushing, pushing him backwards. Now Stephen says, there he is, standing right next to the Father. Who that really had to grip them. They, then they cried out, verse 57, with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Here, we have Saul of Tarsus making his first biblical appearance, you could say. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, now this was Stephen calling upon God. They stoned Stephen, who was calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen was stoned to death. Chapter 8. In verse 1, Saul was given authority to persecute and shut down the church. The gospel has always, as always, spreads during persecution. It was no different in this persecution of the church. In verse 2, that word lamentation means to mourn. So they mourned Stephen's death. Just listening to his message, Stephen was going to be a force to reckon with. He took his calling of God on his life very seriously. He cared for the people and would not hold back the truth from them, even if it meant he would become their enemy, even if it meant that they, he would become enemy number one to them. The scripture comes to, this scripture comes to mind, thinking about Stephen and his message. In Jude chapter 1, the only chapter in the book, verse 20 through 23 says, But ye, beloved... Speaking of the believer, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Stephen was honest. Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. Stephen was full of wisdom. And we, can, we remember that from Acts chapter 6, verse 3. He said, keep yourselves, back to Jude, verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life from now until we get to heaven continuous and continue in this way this is the scripture that comes to mind though thinking about Stephen's strong delivered message to the Jews and some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh some people, you can have compassion and talk to them, and you may not come at them strongly. You may uh, be willing to uh, take your time working with them because you may say, I work with them every day. I'm going to see them tomorrow. I'll see them this weekend. And some people, you may say, I'll never see them again. Let me just lay it all out there for them to know the truth, and hopefully they make the right, the, the right decision. Going back to Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, Saul is making, is, is, is making, uh, causing havoc in the church. He's hauling or dragging people out of the church, and he's committing them to prison. For what, though? 
because they chose to believe Jesus Christ. They chose to believe the scriptures. They, the, because of the moving of the Holy Ghost, think about this for a moment. They were saved, living, living their lives, being kind, being peaceful, all these different attributes of being a Christian. They were not causing trouble in the lives of their neighbors. But this is what Saul was doing, destroying or attempting to destroy the lives of the men and women that began to believe. When you threaten the devil's kingdom, he wants to destroy you. But don't be discouraged. The devil cannot do anything to you which God does not allow. Even if it's death, understand something. This life is not our end as Christians. It is really just the beginning of living life. Acts chapter, chapter 8, verses uh, 8 through 4. Uh, Acts chapter 8, in verse 4, Philip is a product of Stephen's strong and eventual death or his stoning and eventual death. He goes to Samaria, you know, that place where Jesus met that woman at the well, and he began to help her understand everything about her life. This is that same Samaria. The Samaritan, or should we say the Jews, were not to have any dealings with the Samaritans. They were not to deal with the Samaritans at all. But here we find Philip preaching to them. In verse 5, the second half of verse 5, he said, But he went and preached Christ unto them. Philip went and preached Jesus Christ unto these people. You have to understand, this is Philip. This is him being pushed out. This is persecution in the church. Saul of Tarsus being the one to, to overlook all of this. And Philip is a product of being pushed out, being persecuted, and him going and spreading the gospel to another city. In verse 6, they gave heed. They gave heed, they heard, and they saw the miracles that Philip was doing. These were the miracles. One, unclean spirits were cast out of the, uh, of the possessed people. Two, those of the palsy or uh, paralysis, that is to be paralyzed, they were being healed. And three, those who were lame, which was those who were crippled or having a limp, being injured, they also were healed. In verse 8, we see where the results. There is nothing like results in the church. When God does something for people, it is special. There is always joy in the church. And here in verse 8, he speaks about that joy being there. This is the results of Philip of the persecution of the church, Philip going to Samaria, the people hearing, receiving, accepting the preaching of Jesus Christ, them believing, and then the miracles taking place in the lives of men and women, whether it was them getting saved, them getting healed, miracles taking place, all these things, they believed, and these are the results of them believing. When God does something, again, in somebody's life, it is special, and it's always something that we can shout from the mountaintops. As Christians, we want to praise God. We want to praise our God, number one, to glorify Him. Number two, to show appreciation and to realize and help Him or help us ourselves understand and just let God know we understand, God, we are dependent upon you. And number three, so that Others, non-believers, that is, can have something to believe in. In verses 9 through 25, we have a situation. Simon, he was using sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria. In Acts chapter 8, verse 9, so, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the city, in the same city, this is in Samaria, used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that 
himself was some great one. He was a self-promoter. And you have to be rather arrogant to be somebody who would promote yourself. I'm not speaking about taking your rightful place in God. That's different. I'm not speaking about having confidence in the God that we serve. That's not promoting oneself. But that's just being who God made you and who God, uh, what God has put into your heart and what place God has put you in. In verse 9, the second half of it, it says that he was giving out that, giving out that himself was some great one. In verse 10, he had influenced the whole city. It says here in verse 10, this man is the great power of God. That's what it says here in verse 10. It said, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is is the great power of God. So that's what they saw Simon as being. This is the city that God sent Philip to come and preach Jesus Christ unto them. And they were bewitched. They were, the sorcery was used. Uh, they were with magic and trickery. Simon had a hold of the whole city. But Philip went there and recognized something. Philip went there and they began to believe I really truly believe when somebody has the truth presented to them, even after receiving a lie or falsehood for, his, or for their whole life, when they receive the truth of God, it's just that simple to begin to believe and understand and know everything else that I was fed my whole life was not truthful, not real, did not fulfill me, even if it was truthful, but Jesus Christ can fulfill us. I'm trying to stay calm, teach Bible study, not preach. In verse 11, this was not a short while that Simon had confused and tricked these people. It says in verse 11, and to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them, with sorceries. But in verse 11, I love it how no matter how long the devil has a stronghold, God comes in and can flip the script just like that in your life. He can flip the tables on the devil in your life just like that. But God needed a voice to do this with. Let's look at verse, verse 12. He said, But when they believed Philip, Preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. God needs a voice to do this very type of thing with. God needs men and women to answer the call. If God has a call on your life, if God wants you to be a preacher, you will not be happy doing anything else. And you must fulfill that calling in your life to really, truly reach that, uh, that uh, happiness and that, that degree of satisfaction of knowing I am doing what makes me more happy, happier more than anything else in the, in the world. God needs somebody, needs a voice to, for the preaching. Here in this verse, we see there was preaching. We see that the people believed. We see that they were baptized. And even number four in verse 12, verse 13, then Simon himself believed also. Even this one that was dishing out all this sorcery and evil, he even believed. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. He continued with Philip. It says that they were baptized. And if we go to Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, we'll see from Romans chapter 6, verse 1, all the way through 14, how he describes Water baptism. And the people, they believed, number one, they became Christians. They became believers. They repented. 
They accepted Christ as their Savior. And then number two, they were baptized. And let's look at baptism. In Romans chapter 6, he said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How can we who have died to sin? How do we die to sin? We accepted the payment of Jesus Christ, applied it to our lives, and now just as Christ uh, was crucified and died on the cross for our sin, we too also are dead to sin. You'll see that in here. God forbid, verse 2, How shall we that are dead to sin live, in lo- live any longer therein? Know ye not? Don't you know that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? So this water baptism is recognition, or is it helps us understand we, were, we being baptized in water, going under, is if we were baptized with Jesus Christ in his death. He said, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We don't have an excuse, Christian, because the word of God says right here, just as Christ died and rose up, we too died to sin Our sin is crucified, is deadened, and we rise up and walk in newness of life like Jesus Christ. He said, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, if we're going to take on the the, the representation of what a death took on, then we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. He died taking sin with him. But when he rose from the grave, he rose and he he received his glorified body without any blemish whatsoever. He said, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. If we died in this crucifixion with Christ, then we are free from being in the bondage of sin anymore because Christ came and died for our sin. If we take on this same payment, then our sin has died with that. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, He liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let no sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And remember, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer is God forbid. And here in verse 14, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but we are under grace. We are no longer bound to be sinners. Sin has died, and we are dead to sin, and we are alive to Christ. Besides all of what the Scriptures declare, besides all of what the Scriptures warn us about, Besides all of what the scriptures share, all of the love of God that comes pouring into our soul when we read the word of God, besides all of that, it really comes down to this. What is in our heart? What do I want to do? Because we, we have the scriptures. We have the word of God. The Holy Ghost is present and deals with mankind. It comes down to what 
do I want to do? And people will do exactly what they want. And if that is to live in sin, then that's what people will do. If you have sin in the heart, it will come to the surface. You must be willing to see it for what it is, to slay it, and desire to live for God. In verse 13, going back to Acts chapter 8, verse 13, Simon gets himself entangled in his own mind. Acts chapter 8, verse 13, he says, Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, so he believed and he was baptized in water, he continued with Philip. And this is something that caught my attention. So he continued with Philip. He continued walking and following after Philip. But look at this. And what did he do? The Bible says he wandered. He wandered in his mind. One. And then he was beholding the miracles and signs which were done. I don't know what, how much time we've got left here. So he was wandering, number one, and he was beholding. He was wandering and he was beholding. So let's look at this, this, the definitions of these two words. He was wandering. To wander is to put out of wits or to stand out of wits to astound or to become astounded, to be insane, it says. To be, to amaze, be astonished, be beside oneself. And listen to this. That word wandered means to bewitch. This, this Simon, he was following after Peter but he was still continuing to think how he thought before because he was used sorcery and he bewitched the people. He still had that thought process that God didn't get out of him just yet. And then it says that he was beholding the signs and miracles that they were doing. So here you can see Simon. He was wandered about what Peter, what Philip was doing. And he was watching what Philip was doing, what God really was doing by the hand of Philip with the signs and the miracles. And I can see, think about it for a minute. Here's this guy that bewitched the people with trickery and magic and all these things. And now he sees Philip preaching to the people and them getting healed. Those who were paralyzed, walking again. Those who were lame, no longer having that limp, no longer being crippled. Those who were, who were sinners, being saved. All these things happening to the people. But Simon, thinking back, or thinking with the mindset that he had before he believed, allowing himself to be entangled with how he used to think, not having the new mind of Christ. And this word beholding in this verse, says he was beholding the miracles and signs that is to be a spectator of, to discern or intensively acknowledge, to behold, to consider, to look on, to perceive. He was really focused in on the miracles and the signs, wow, look at Simon. Exactly how he used to think is how he was going forward in his new walk with God. We cannot allow how we used to think infiltrate how God is helping us to have a new mind, a new outlook on life, a new walk with God. You have to beware of your past so that the devil does not take occasion to use it against you. Instead of forgetting his past and pressing forward, looking at Jesus Christ, he was using his old mindset, his corrupted thinker, and he began, he was using this corrupted thinker, 
And he began allowing it to influence his new walk in life. We're almost done. I'm going a little bit longer, but I want to get somewhere. I definitely wanted to get to get to help you understand something about Simon. This man, he began to believe, but he began to believe and pulled in his old thought pattern with this new walk with God. So often that's what new Christians do. They pull in their old thought process, thinking that they could use that mindset to go forward in this new walk with God. But no, you have to have a new mindset, a new outlook, a new way of looking at things, not your way, but God's will, not my will, but God, your will be done in my life. In verse 14, Peter and John were deployed by the Holy Ghost to come into Samaria. The new Christians in Samaria, they were believing the preaching. They were hearing about Jesus Christ. They were hearing about the kingdom of God. They were hearing about who the Holy Ghost was. And if you want to go deeper in God, then I encourage you, check out Acts chapter 8. Look at verse 15 for a minute. We'll do that together. Who, Peter and John, were dispatched by the Holy Ghost from Jerusalem to come to Samaria. Who, meaning speaking of Peter and John, who, when they were come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So we have, they believed, they became believers. We have, they were Baptized in water, that's one, two, and then we have the third one, that they would receive the Holy Ghost. And if you are a Christian, those three things right there. One, you got saved. Two, if you got baptized in water, it's a recognition showing everybody, grandma and everybody else, I'm a Christian and I want to live for God. I'm I'm taking that flag and waving it high that I'm a Christian now. But number three, the one thing that Christians in this world so often think that already has existed, or already they have, and that is the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. But Peter and John, here in Acts chapter 8, verse 15, God's word, it shows us. When they were come down to, to Samaria, they prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So they didn't receive it at Philip's preaching. Not that they couldn't, but they hadn't yet. It shows it here. And now, going forward, look forward to seeing you next week, preaching or teaching to you about the rest of this and how Simon comes out of this.